Incredible ocean, magical place to be. So much that we can learn from life in the deep blue sea. Incredible ocean, magical place to be. So much that we can learn from life in the deep blue sea. Hello and welcome to the Brighton Science Festival. I'm so excited to see you. And uh, so far, it's been um, a great time at the festival. Um, my co hosts are having a little bit of an issue getting online, uh, such as the way with all these virtual events. So, for now, I am going to talk to you about a lovely interview that I had with the Brighton uh, Dolphin Project. So I spoke to Thea, um, Thea Taylor, who is the, ah, oh, yay, <laughs> you're here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, two, two webcams died on us. <laughs> Who'd have thought? We're here, here. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yes, I yes, have yes, to take yes. that Ooh. on my own. How are you guys doing apart from all the tech issues? We're good, we're good. We are so professional right now. Hi, everyone. We are back doing a live stream. And it's not just Abby. It's not just me. Amazing, amazing. Right. Uh, carry on with what you were saying, Abby. Yeah, sorry, we'll shut up. Yeah, we'll no worries. So I was just telling the guys about a lovely interview that I had with Thea Taylor from the Brighton Dolphin Project. Um, and um, I will show a really short clip about it. It's really hard to put what was like an hour and a bit conversation into just a few minutes, but uh, we did our best. So I will play that Just now. really quick before you do that, Abby. Yes. Is there some kind of special occasion that there is today? Is there some reason that we're doing this? Yeah, yeah, you missed that bit. But yeah, oh, yeah. it is Brighton Commons <laughs> Festival. Yeah, I'll shut up, I'll shut up. It's Brighton Commons Festival. I'm really excited. Okay, play your show, play your show. We're so smooth, we're so professional. Let's do this. Welcome, Thea. Hello. Hi, nice to be here. So basically my job is collecting all the sightings that people submit to us and putting them all into a big data system um, and kind of tracking our tracking our populations, where they are, what they're doing, um, how many we're seeing. The Brighton Dolphin Project really is a partner of the World Station Alliance. Um, they're the world's largest marine conservation partnership. Um, and they realised that their head office was in Brighton and they have partnerships all over the globe but they weren't doing anything in their own home country. Wow. So two years ago, they started the Brighton Dolphin Project. Um, and it was basically one or two volunteers in a tiny little office with no windows on Brighton <laughs> seafront. Um, and it's grown massively. Um, we started off just doing little educational things, um, but it really quickly captured the hearts and minds of the local community because dolphins, you know, they're such a charismatic animal. Yeah. Um, so we began holding small events, helping other organisations with their beach cleans. Um, and before long, we were rolling out talks and interactive games into schools um, and having our own little discovery centre as well. So it's grown massively. And has the team grown? Or is it just, yeah. just a couple of you in a little office with no windows? <laughs> yeah, so we've moved to Shoreham. And we have windows. Um, so we've now got a core team um, of three or four key volunteers. Um, and then we have upwards of a hundred other volunteers that help us out with kind of day-to-day -day running of things, um, events when, when we're able to go and hold them again um, and running our boat trips as well. The majority of our research, um, which is our, our kind of main aim at the moment, um, comes from members of the public and our volunteers that are out on the water. Until recently, there was very little research actually done on marine mammals in Sussex. They studied up around Dungeness, up the west coast, up the east coast rather, um, <laughs> and they've done uh, kind of from the Isle of Wight down the west coast. 
Um, yeah. But Sussex was a big, big blank patch because it's there's so much commercial activity here on the sea. Right. Okay. You've got commercial fishing, you've got the shipping lanes. People just kind of assumed that there was nothing here. Um, mm -hmm. But the anecdotal and historical evidence that we were finding proves that that wasn't the case. And from our research, we've really found that there's a lot more here than people ever realise. So, yeah, you're saying there is actual life. The, the more yeah. the, um, the evidence shows that there's actually a lot going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a lot more than we ever thought. I mean, the fact that we've got four um, four species of cetacean off our coast is more than we ever thought. We kind of knew there was harbour porpoise. Um, yep. They're the UK, they're the smallest cetacean. They're, they're lovely. They're one of my favourite species. Um, oh, they're very shy, very elusive. You don't see them very often. Um, and we knew they were bottom-nosed dolphins from reports from fishermen. Um, but what we didn't know is we also have white-beaked dolphins, kind of a little bit more offshore, but they're still in our waters, um, and common Atlantic dolphins as well in the summer. We have two species of seahorse, which a lot of people don't know. Um, we have the short snout and the spiny seahorse off our coasts. We already have one marine conservation zone for them, um, but again, it's quite small um, and not particularly overprotected. So we'd like to look at active restoration for seagrass to try and uh, improve the habitat for those species as well. From Jessie, age eight, she's from Rottingdean. Mm -hmm. Are dolphins seen in Brighton? So actually, um, the majority of our sightings come from um, between uh, Shoreham and Peacehaven. So a lot of our sightings come from around Brighton. We're not sure if that's because that's kind of where our main following is, um, but they're definitely out there. How big are grey seals? Adult male grey seals um, can get to over six feet. Pretty that's, big. Mega, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but we've got some lovely shots of grey seals. Um, so this is from your collection of sightings. Yeah, we've got some uh, some really great photographers out on the beaches, which is fantastic. He's handsome, isn't he? <laughs> He's very handsome. Well, thank you so much um, for your time and for answering all those questions and telling me about all no, your no, no, no. projects. I mean, you have so much going on. It's all such really great work. So yeah, yeah I'm really excited to see how it how it all unfolds. Amazing. One go. Yeah, and it was so difficult trying to really hone down on several points that I discussed with Thea, but they have so many awesome projects going on and the volunteers and the community in Sussex, sort of in and around Brighton, um, specifically, uh, really are important to their projects. Um, so I would definitely say for anyone watching that is interested, not in just dolphins, but sort of the marine life and everything else to take a look at their website um, and see how you can get involved because they just have so much going on. And I think in the coming months, they'll really, really be needing um, the support of their volunteers. So you can find that out just like, yeah, I was going to say, just on the bottom of the screen there is yeah. how you will check them out. I think not many people realise that normally dolphins and stuff you associate with going, uh, you know, somewhere abroad, somewhere uh, like so it's really nice that actually we've got these things in our water. Totally, yeah. I mean, not just the larger mammals as well, which we don't actually really associate, or a lot of people don't associate with the UK, but the more sort of exotic species like the seahorses. And also we have some fantastic seaweed, seagrass um, species as well, which we're really trying to, well, say we, the Brighton Dolphin Project are potentially trying to uh, regenerate. And that's another big project that they've got um and fingers crossed when they're allowed to do tours again they'll be able to take out their wildlife tours which go around the coast and you can visit their offshore wind farms as well because that's a really big project that they've been putting a lot of time into so it's a really exciting time um and um you know i know that wind energy energy is something that you have been looking at too so i've said i was like fingers crossed when we can get down there we'll have to all buy a ticket and go on one of their tours to go visit. To Definitely. Go visit but yeah, yeah, as you said, I thought, let's have a look at wind turbines. <laughs> everyone's like, what? Isn't that really boring? Why do we know about wind turbines? Well, I thought for me, uh, I would do a thing about wind turbines for a number of reasons. So first of all, 
I was in Brighton for 10 years and I, I moved away uh, like four years ago. And it's only recently I kind of went back there. And the biggest change that I could see was the fact that they had um, this giant winter farm along the horizon. So uh, I, was like, I can't believe those changes that have come in. <laughs> Uh, so I mean a little bit of music like you hear a lot of those guys talk about when they do. Well, but Abby, no, could you just mute for a sec? Uh, yeah. I think or we use your headphones. Just we're getting a lot of echo uh, here on the line. Cool. There we go. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, like bias stuff about whether it they're good, whether they're bad. You know, pro environmental people like obviously are like they're amazing. They're the solution. Whereas other people are like, oh, they hack birds into pieces. You know, kind of. So I thought it would actually be really good to uh, to kind of investigate this. So it was really cool, actually, because during lockdown, we were making these videos by ourselves in our room. And this was the first video that not only did I make outside, but I was able to meet up with Abby, like another person to help do that. Which uh, So we have now got a little, video, a little video about wind turbines. There we go. Go. Press play, Abby. Wind energy is a great way to generate never ending electricity without producing any harmful greenhouse gases. But can wind turbines also be bad for the environment? Humans have harnessed the power of wind for thousands of years, but it's only in the last 130 years that we've been able to use it to generate electricity. In 1887, Scottish engineer James Blythe designed and built the world's first wind turbine and used it to power his holiday cottage. Since then, vast wind turbines have been popping up all over the place on land and offshore. Wind power currently produces around 20% or a fifth of our total electricity and this month the government announced ambitious plans to power all of the UK using wind power by 2030. Clearly this is excellent news, after all wind turbines don't produce any carbon dioxide while they generate electricity so they don't contribute to climate change. And as long as the sun shines, there's going to be wind on Earth, which means that this energy resource is 100% renewable. Unlike our finite supply of fossil fuels, we're never going to run out of wind. But are wind turbines harmful to wildlife? Before a wind farm is built, teams of ecologists carry out an environmental impact assessment to check there's no rare or endangered species in the area. While the wind farm is being built, it's obviously disruptive. As well as destroying the seabed, it creates a lot of underwater noise pollution and really impacts water quality. But once the array is built, it actually benefits sea creatures. As boats aren't allowed around the turbines, it offers a safe haven for fish and porpoises, as well as providing a habitat for mussels, crabs and anemones, increasing the overall biodiversity of the area. And research shows the turbines have hardly any impact on seabirds too. Herring girls are unaffected by them, while cormorants simply avoid them. So, is wind power the answer to all our problems? Unfortunately, in our rush to reduce carbon emissions, we may have overlooked a few things. It takes a lot of resources to make a wind turbine. It needs to be mined and then extracted, which damages vast areas of land and gives off loads of greenhouse gases. Each turbine also uses around a tonne of rare earth metals, some of which are obtained by deep sea mining. And then there's the turbine blades themselves. While the metals in the shaft can be recycled, the blades are made from fiberglass, which makes them really difficult to recycle. At present, old blades are just buried in the ground, which adds 400 million tonnes of waste to our landfills every year. Out of sight, out of mind. The good news is that we're recognising this shortfall and are adapting. As well as coming up with innovative ways of repurposing old blades, we're also discovering ways to recycle blades, allowing us to turn them into virtually anything. But then there's the onshore impact of offshore wind farms. 
So if a wind farm is remote, which they tend to be, we currently have to dig up our countryside and our farmland and our woodland habitats to bury massive cables to get the electricity to the national grid. Instead, we could feed the electricity that's generated offshore into a modular offshore substation, which uses less cabling and has much less impact on the environment. These systems are already in use across Europe, so we should definitely be using them more here. The key thing to remember is it's up to all of us to curb our electricity use. Generating electricity always has some negative impact, so being more mindful about how much electricity we're using will help us beat climate change. Make sure to check out Avi's awesome video. It's really good and it's all about how to reduce your carbon footprint. Woohoo! There we go. All good stuff. Uh, yeah. I, I really enjoyed researching that video because for me, I was like, wind turbines, they're amazing. And then I found out that actually, um, yeah, we need to do some, a little still tweak how good wind turbines are to make them better and include them a bit more in the circular economy. So uh, but I, well, it, the good news is there's more and more and more companies who are popping up who realise that this is like an untapped resource in terms of the fibre, the blades and repurposing them and turning them into new stuff, so. I was just saying, I had no idea that the blades were made of fiberglass. That's that's really cool. Like, I, all I know about fiberglass is it's in my loft. That's it. But the fact that you make turbine blades out of it as well, that's pretty cool. Well, it's, it's kind of like a boat hull, which, you know, like, so fiberglass is glass fiber. And up in our loft, you just have it in, like, big padded stuff because it insulates mm -hmm. things. But... Uh, in boats and things, you squash it together and layer it up a little bit like plywood so it's really strong, but you need that flexibility on the blade so they've got a little bit of give, because if they were metal, they'd obviously be really heavy and you'd need much more energy to get them going, but you also need that slight flex in them as well. So there we go. Yeah. Out. Amazing. I think what I took out of that as well was the um, how good it is to have the discussion so, you know, there are obviously pros and cons and you go in with this sort of idea of what you think is right or wrong. But there are so many different factors, aren't there? And I think that's what I really got out of it was sort of exploring all sides of the the argument and the approach. And actually just, you know, it's really healthy to be having these sort of discussions. Um, Definitely. I think and, and an unbiased and balanced debate and obviously us as like marine organisation, you want to make sure that, uh, yeah, that if you're telling people, oh, yeah, wind turbines are really good, we need them to get out of a zero carbon economy, that you're not actually impacting the sea in, or the marine environment in an adverse way, because it's like, well, you know, which is, which is the lesser of the two evils? Is it better to put more carbon dioxide but not build wind turbines in the sea? Or, yeah, but it's about doing it in a way that we're not just shifting the environmental damage to a different area, so. And there we go. So um, I've done lots of talking, I've realised. And we, we've, we've got a little running sheet here that tells us things we're supposed to say. And one of them is that, obviously, we're going out at 11 o'clock today because we wanted to be like, hey, schools, check this out. We're going to do live streams and things. Ordinarily, we'd be going into schools and visiting people. And, and it's quite tricky to do that at the moment. So if you are a school watching this or a teacher watching this or you know any teacher friends or anything like that, then do get in touch with us because one of the things that we're starting to do is more and more live streams in school. So there is an email at the bottom and obviously you can go to our website as well and you can email us and be like, Oi, can you guys like, oh, my school, I want something fun to happen in my school. And we can do like live streams for you guys. And if you tell us what you kind of thing you want us to do about, uh, we can tie all that, all that stuff in and make it really fun, really relevant, and hopefully interesting and sciencey, all those things. I'll shut up now. So, uh, yeah, in addition to that, I'm going to quickly do that bit as well. Okay, you do that. We, we are uh, currently an entirely volunteer-run organisation. We run entirely off um, donations and grants. So there is a PayPal link on pretty much every social media platform you can go and click. It's something like forward slash Incred Oceans. Um, please, if you have anything to spare, the odd pound here or there, it's really appreciated and it helps us upgrade so we have less technical issues when we do live streams. So that's nice. Technical issues, what technical issues? What, what technical issues? I mean. <laughs> no, it really does. It allows us to do lots more content and also the research and the traveling part as well. Um, 
it allows us to sort of delve a lot more into it and um, put uh, more time and energy into all of it. So, definitely. Um, right. So, um, we are slightly sad today because we did have a mermaid who was going to come visit us and it was and amazingly her name is annette annette the mermaid is like so marine um but the sad thing is is that her, she had a catastrophic that is what her and i think right now that's what her face looks like because she has been subjected to a catastrophic laptop destruction basically if she just gone and like set it on fire and then frisbeed it into the ocean it would probably be in a better state than it is right now um so she cannot get online and her she spent ages making a really cool video about the science and the mythology of mermaids and that's just gone so we're like mermaids we love mermaids and obviously brighton we used to do march of the mermaids that's what incredible oceans of welfare used to run so we're like oh we can't get the mermaids but what we're gonna do because we because we're so good and we're so conscientious we're gonna do the video the mermaid video and we're gonna release it in the future so you'll... so make sure to hit subscribe on our youtube channel if you want to get a little notification when that one pops up in a few weeks subscribing to our youtube channel is definitely the best thing that you can do today because we hit 400 subscribers the other day and 400 I think... so cry with happiness over here big moment big moment in all our lives just you know sophia does lots of social media for us and just you know in the last week she spent 40 hours on social media what is that like my brain would melt and start dripping out my ears if i spent that long on social media so uh respect respect to the social media goddess that is sophia <laughs> and on the subject of sophia yeah okay so i've got a video next that's exciting really pumped for that um so you guys probably already know from previous live streams or if this is your first time here um i'm an earth scientist so my background is geography and geology but i have a huge shut up geology is not as boring as people make it out you're going to see in a minute um, I have a huge passion for the oceans. So we're doing like a sort of small mini series of earth science and the seas. And what you're going to see here is like episode three of that, which is all about the age of our earth and how um, our chalk cliffs along the South Downs helped scientists to determine the age of the earth. Um, and also why Brighton is a pebble beach, coincidentally. So why is Brighton a pebble beach? Why? Why? Roll VT. Let's have a look. Let's find out. Welcome back to another episode of IOTV. Today, let's talk about the ultimate fight between physicists and geologists. Through the ages, there have been tons of ways people have tried to determine the age of our planet. Let's start with William Thomson, a renowned physicist and the first to publish his attempt. He estimated that the Earth had originated as a ball of molten rock, and tried to calculate how long it had taken this ball to solidify. This estimation put the age of the Earth at between 20 to 100 million years. But his downfall was that he didn't take into account important things like plate tectonics and volcanoes. Next, we've got geologists like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin. Yes, Darwin did consider himself a geologist before a biologist. Geology rocks. They were basically like, dude, no, this is not correct. Darwin's theory of evolution alone suggested that animals evolved slowly over billions of years, not millions. And looking just at the fossil record, they could tell that this estimation was not accurate. Darwin lived in Kent, so he spent a lot of time looking at the white cliffs along the south coast, which are made from the skeletons of tiny planktonic algae called coccoliths that live floating in the ocean. When the algae died, they sank to the ocean floor where they were mushed and squashed with other creatures and over time formed the iconic cliffs we see here today. He estimated that this would have taken millions of years for the coccoliths to have been compressed into rock. As well as the cliffs, he looked at the Sussex and Kent Weald. He tried to estimate how long he thought it would take an area of this size to be eroded. From this, he drew the conclusion that the Earth was 300 million years old. <laughs> Wrong! Fun fact! The lines you see in the chalk are flint. This is a silica-based rock also made of marine organisms and is the reason why so many of our beaches in the south are pebbly. 
A fellow named John Jolly presented his estimation for the age of the planet. This is linked to another big ocean question, which is why are our oceans salty? He thought that if you could estimate the age of the ocean, you could estimate the age of the planet. And to do this, we should look at salt accumulation in the ocean. Because he assumed that the ocean had started off as a fresh body of water. So why are our oceans salty, you ask? Well, this is linked to rock erosion. When it rains, the water travels over the land, picking up minerals from rocks. This water then ends up in the river and then into the ocean. Jolly asked how long it would take for rivers to transport this amount of mineral into the ocean to give it its current level of saltiness. His answer? 90 to 100 million years. Still wrong. Not so jolly now. So who finally cracked it, I hear you ask? Well, that takes us to 1913 and the geologist Arthur Holmes, who came up with a new method of dating rocks. That's right, radiometric dating. looked at the radioactive elements in the rock and the speed at which they decay due to the cooling of the earth that Thompson had already identified. Since these elements are likely to have been present when the planet first formed, if you compare their original chemical formula with the average rate of decay, it's possible to work out how long these elements have been around for. He originally estimated that the planet was 1.6 billion years old. Nope. But after further calculation, he later revised this number to 4.5 billion years. Ding, 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 ding! Almost spot on! Since then, we've used multiple dating methods to further refine this number, and we now know that the age of the planet and the solar system is between 4.53 and 4.58 billion years old. And that, everyone, is how our ocean and our chalk cliffs help scientists to determine the age of the planet and why we can't build sandcastles on Brighton Beach. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you guys back here next week for another episode of IOTV. Woo! <laughs> You've not Woo! That was awesome. has walked past you singing Radioactive on Brighton Beach, so... What did they say? We had some weird looks. Did they say anything? No, no, they just really There's stared. some weird looks. At Solera and I, for a long time, just crazy people singing radioactive to ourselves on the beach. It's good, it's good. I like, yeah. I like what you did there. Um, personally, that's the thing I've always wondered. Why was Brighton Beach always pebbly? And everyone's like, every time someone turned up, I'd be like, welcome to Brighton Beach. Oh, the beach, the beach is always pebbly. And I'm like, actually, it's much better because if you go to a sand beach, what I know is you take about half the beach home with you and you're still finding it a week later on all your clothes and in various cracks and crevices. So, um, yes, I prefer the pebbles. Yeah, I mean, I live in Brighton and I, I, apart from, you know, you get used to the pebbles walking over them eventually, don't you? Yeah, your, your feet harden. That's feet. how you know true Brightonians, the ones that can just walk on pebbles without flinching. And uh, compared to the ones that are like hobbling their way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, yeah, I like the pebbles are good. The pebbles are strong. I once, okay, so this is one of my, I'm going to rant now. So we live this right now. The UK is the ninth largest island on earth, okay? And you can never be more than an hour's drive from the sea. And I went and gave a talk in a school in Luton, right, which is in the middle of the country. And I spoke to a room of 16 year olds a third of which had never even seen the sea. And I showed them a picture of Brighton Beach and this kid put his hand up and went, what's all over, Bri what's that all over the beach? And I was like, what, what do you mean? He was like, is that, is that rubbish all over the beach? And I'm like, no, I was like, this is actually quite clean for Brighton Beach. What is he talking about? And it was the pebbles because they'd never seen a, a beach before. In their head, it was these beautiful tropical beaches that you get. Wow. And it, the idea, and I said, these are pebbles, and we get beaches that are made of pebbles. And this murmur, everyone was like, really? And they were like, no way. And that was, that was the thing that blew their mind, that, they, that pebble beaches exist. I was like, oh, my goodness me, we've got a lot of work to do here. So, yes, there we go.
So I'm just going to reiterate that. If you want us to come do a talk in the school, let us know. And we're going to do Q&A. So if there's any questions you guys have about the videos that we've shared today or anything else really to do with Under the Seas, we'll always do our best to answer it. We've got like quite a broad range of um, skills, skill sets here. Yeah, so from geography, geology, conservation, a little bit of physics. Anyone, yeah. anyone love plankton as much as Russell? That's I love <laughs> plankton. Everyone loves plankton. But we're not going to go on that today. We're talking about the the, the Brighton stuff, the cool Brighton, Brighton stuff. stuff. The Brighton. The, so Best place to grab a sandwich. Oh, yeah, good Brighton stuff. Well, let me think. Well, obviously, it's the Kipper Shack on the seafront. you got to, I mean, it's all about the Kipper Shack, isn't it? Everyone loves the Kipper Shacks. Unsponsored. There but we go. not for long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Brighton Fishing Museum, like one of the coolest places. Everyone wants to go to Brighton Fishing Museum. I mean, if we talk about museums in Brighton. The Booth Museum. Ah, there's a fact. Here's a fact about the Booth Museum. As all of the other regional uh, museums across Sussex have closed down or got rid of their natural history collection, because the Booth's is the largest repository of Victorian taxidermy in the world. All of the artifacts from the rest of the county have ended up in the Booth Museum and they have got the most specimens in the UK outside of the Natural History Museum in London. So if you have not been to the Booth Museum, you need to go and just be like, what? There we go. I saw a comment there about plankton. It just came up at the bottom of the screen. New comments. Oh, no plankton. <laughs> I like the song. Definitely, definitely right. Vicky, I love plankton. That sunflower one, that's mesodinium. Mesodinium is close to my close to my heart, mesodinium. And I'm hoping to finish my PhD soon. And when I do finish my PhD, I am going to get a mesodinium tattoo. So there we go. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a plank stamp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely. That is a bit, yeah. Um, on the subject of just quickly museums and, and anything else, is there any, any other sort of uh, environmental slash educational places worth a visit or sort of historical monuments or anything in Brighton that you also would suggest people if they are able to get out and have a walk to I mean there's obviously such gorgeous coastline um so the other thing I would really recommend one of my so uh there's a really really awesome website called Atlas Obscura and it's got 40,000 places globally and these are like the weird and wonderful places that you can visit for whenever and I used to be I used to write up the places for Brighton there so if you go on there and just search for Brighton, all the cool, weird and wonderful places will come up. But there's two really awesome ones on the beach that I'd recommend. So one is a flint grotto made by a fisherman called Rory. Uh, so he has a patch of land where he stores his boat on Brighton Beach. And uh, he realized that he just needed like a table to like cut things up on and make things like a workbench. He used to be a dry stone waller. So he used all the pebbles from the beach to start making this like, I don't know, this like work table. And then he started like adding to it and it just kind of snowballed. And now he's got like a whole sculpture garden where he recreates like really famous, like old statues, but using pebbles off Brighton Beach. Um, it's amazing. So definitely go and check out Rory's Flint Grotto. Uh, and the other really cool thing is obviously the Vox Railway. It's Britain's oldest electric railway. And if you've not ever trundled along the seafront from the Palace Pier to uh, to the marina, I'd strongly recommend it. But what not many people know, not what many people know, is that beyond the marina, Volks wanted to go all the way to Rottingdean. But because the cliffs were so steep, the train couldn't get up to Rottingdean. So he, the only way he could do it was to make the train go through the sea. So he made a train on stilts that went through the water. And in order to make it stable, he had to make the, the track really, really wide. Uh, annoyingly, it, it was an awesome thing, but it got it basically a storm came and like destroyed it. But 
at extreme low tides, if you go down to the far side of the marina, not only is it awesome for rock pooling, but you can still see the tracks um, that go through the water all the way to Rottingdean. And they hold the world record for being the widest gauge railway on earth. So there you go, rail nerds. You can go check that out. And if you want to see what the weird stilt uh, train looked like, they have a recreation of it in Brighton Toy Museum, which is underneath the Brighton station. So definitely go in there as well. There we go. Those are my facts. I, I've got one. I do have one. Go on. um, equally nerdy, to be fair. But so where that we filmed that video that we showed earlier, where I was like stroking, stroking the cliff because I do like I like a good cliff. You know, we like some, we like the rocks. So if anyone is a big rock person or wants to see the cliffs a bit better, that video was taken at Splash Point in Seaford, which is just down the coast. It's like a 20 minute drive. Um, and it's one of very few places where you can safely get out closer to the rocks, because obviously we need to stay, you know, at least two, three meters away from cliff edges. Um, because a lot of them are unstable, but that one isn't, and it's it's quite okay to go up and walk past Splash Point and, and have a closer look at the cliffs. So if that's your thing, if you're a cliff person like me, um, definitely go check it out. Do you, is there, are you a <laughs> fan of Cliff Richard? Someone move on. <laughs> <laughs> so in, um, in another absence, so obviously we don't have her beautiful video and we don't have her, um, but we do have a very, very, very short clip of Annette whilst out filming yesterday, um, which I think tribute to her efforts. Shall we play it? Definitely. This is this is Annette solidarity. We so you can be with the with us today. Mm. Sorry, dead fish. Mm. And on that note, I think that we might end our live stream, which would be pretty awesome. What I'd like to do before we go really quickly is just tell everyone that on the 3rd of November, which is in a little while, like a week and a bit, it's Tuesday, 3rd of November. I know this is a date in all of your calendars, but it's World Jellyfish Day. Everyone loves jellyfish. In fact, but we're not supposed to call them jellyfish. We're because supposed to call them jellies. Jellies, because they're, they're not, not fish. fish. They're not fish. They're jellies. So World Jelly Day. But then Americans would be like, hey, why are you like celebrating jam? Because they call jam like pe jelly. peanut butter jelly sandwich. Yeah. And, or imagine like if you actually made a sandwich with peanut butter and then a jellyfish. That would be gross. I'm just saying that would be really gross. Come on. Come on! I dare you to eat a jellyfish and peanut butter sandwich. Not I'm, okay. I'm vegetarian. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, so we are teaming up with an awesome arts organisation called Instar, who are based in Nottingham, and they make massive kinetic sculptures, and they're going to make a giant uh, kinetic sculpture of a jellyfish, hopefully for Nottingham Science Festival. So we're connecting up the science festivals, Brighton Science Festival today, Nottingham Science Festival is happening next February, but we are going to do a jellyfish special where we're just going to have like a chilled out chat and we're going to talk about kinetic sculptures and jellyfish and everything in between. So we're gonna, that's going to go out at six o'clock on November the 3rd. Will be like, follow us on social media. You'll hear all about that shizzle. Uh, but yeah, until then, go to our YouTube channel. Hit subscribe. Binge watch all our videos. Tell all your friends. Hit the thumbs up if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, totally add comments, even if it's stupid comments, or if you want to ask questions, do that, and we'll get back to you on those. But, yeah. yeah. We also have some questions really quickly to answer before we go. Yeah. Before we go today. Oh should, we do, should we do that? Yes, do the questions, man. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Um, so, 
one for you, Russell. Where were you guys filming when at the wind turbines? Lovely. So uh, I lived in Brighton. Then I decided to move to London during lockdown. Uh, I'll be honest, I didn't particularly get on very well with London. I found that it was a bit polluted for my liking. And being an asthmatic, a sensitive asthmatic soul, I decided to escape to the countryside. So I recently moved to Stroud, which is the headquarters of Ecotricity. And Ecotricity are a obviously uh, an electricity company that provide sustainable electricity to people. And when they started out, they talked to a load of farmers and were like, hey, uh, can we put a wind turbine up on your land and we'll negotiate a really good rate of electricity for you in exchange for that? So the wind turbine that me and Abby filmed in front of was the first ever ecotricity wind turbine, which is up on Lynch Knoll uh, near Stroud. The interesting start to that is it was actually um, put up by just one individual, the chap who started Ecotricity, and he essentially was a sort of low-key traveller, and he set up camp there. And that uh, wind turbine was to purely provide himself with electricity. Um, and then he started to naturally speak to the farmers and said, you know, if I were to build you one of this similar prototype, you could have your own electricity. So it started in a really actually sort of natural and uh, natural way and grew quite organically. So it had a quite a humble beginning, which is it's what I quite like about about ecotricity. Definitely. You've got to you've got to start with a positive idea and roll with it. Oh, yeah. Uh, another question from a Grace. Is there anything we can do with the blades or make blades out of something that is reusable? Uh, so what they do at the moment, there is a really cool company, I think, I can't remember their name, they call something like Global Systems Limited or something like that. And basically, they just pop, they like turn them into little pellets. Um, and then those pellets can be reformed into other things. So the main things that they, they turn them into are like packing crates, you know, like you would get in warehouses and things like that. Um, but so obviously that's recycling. If you want to reuse the blades, uh, their people have been using them in uh, playgrounds because they're massive. They're basically like a big tunnel. Uh, so there's lots of places in Italy, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, where they're just taking these giant wind turbines and repurposing them into children's playgrounds, which is quite a nice thing to do. Awesome. And they're also trying to use a type of recyclable resin, so a natural resin material, which can, uh, which is even more green in the first place, which is pretty cool, I believe. Um, lovely. Next question we have. Sorry, I'm trying to stop down there. I like this one. Is there anything Russell doesn't know? <laughs> I know lots of things, but some things I don't know. Like I don't know how to iron t-shirts. Clearly, um, I don't know what. There's, there's a lot. Why are you asking me what you don't know? <laughs> I, don't know. I, I don't know a lot. I know. I know. I know what I know. And I, I can nerd out about weird things in Brighton and the sea. And luckily, this live stream is about both of those things. So if you were to ask me about, I mean, I don't think I've ever got a question on University Challenge. So there we go. I've got a question here, which is on our Instagram, which is why are jellyfish not called jellyfish? Because they're not fish. They're not fish. A fish is a boat has bones inside it, either made from bone or made from cartilage, like a shark. Um, and those are and stingrays, and those are a slightly different group of fish called elasmobranchs. Uh, but jellyfish don't have any kind of internal skeleton at all. Uh, they are, uh, depending on the species, some are what we would call tenophores, which is spelled C T E N O four. Uh, ten of fours. Um, you also get, I guess, like a, a cousin of jellyfish, which are called siphonophores, which actually aren't organisms, they're a collection of animals. Um, so that's things like the Portuguese man of war isn't actually a jellyfish or a jelly, it's actually a siphonophore. So yes, those are the, yeah, that's why jellyfish are jellyfish. They're actually like 99% water. They don't have a brain. They're weird. They are weird. And some of them can live forever, but you'll find all this out when you come on to Jellyfish Day. Jellyfish Day. Or mm. Jelly Day. Jelly Day. Third of November, be there. Or jelly, be square. Jelly, be there. Day. Be there. jelly Day. <laughs> well, I suppose if you were square, you'd be a box jellyfish, wouldn't you? Good point. 
Right. Um, lovely. That's it for our questions from what I can see. Uh, we do have lots of mermaid questions, but what I will say is when we do um, put out the mermaid video, um, put all your questions in there and we will we will do it all again for that. We can do, we can do an Instagram live and answer the mermaid questions or something like that. And Annette can dress up as the mermaid and answer them in as a mermaid mm -hmm. from first-hand experience. I'm really, I want to mermaid questions. Oh. <gasps> Sophia, who is your favorite geologist? Can you oh, Do you know who I have a really huge crush on? Ian Stewart. Does he make your bedrock? Oh. Ah, he's a nice guy. Stop. Um, yeah, Professor Ian Stewart, you know, he does lots of like programs on BBC about volcanoes and earthquakes and stuff. I met him once at a conference and he actually spoke to me and I went a little bit like, well, it went a little bit like a jelly to be honest with you. I was like, oh, you know everything there is to know about geology. Did you, did you sting me? It's, no, yeah. no. Oh dear, I've had enough of Russell's jokes. Before. Can, surely, is there a geologist I, I don't like how you've, you know, turned, you've objectified the geologist. Is there a geologist that you actually like because of a, like an oh, actual it, scientific process? Or have you just, or I is like, it just because you fancy them as, as, as sex objects, Sophia? I like him because he knows tons and tons of things about volcanoes and earthquakes. But another really cool geologist is one that I mentioned in that video, which is Charles Lyle, um, because he has done some amazing things. Um, he was like the daddy of geology back in the day. And yeah, if, you, if you're interested, you know, give him a Google, he's fantastic. And obviously there's Mary Anning, who's one of my favorite. Is she a geologist, paleontologist, fossil hunter? Mary Anning, she's awesome, check her out. There we go, right, I'm gonna go now. Yes, <laughs> on that note. Yeah. Oh, bye everyone, see you in World Jelly Day. Bye. 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 Incredible ocean, magical place to be. So much that we can learn from life in the deep blue sea. Incredible ocean, magical place to be. So much that we can learn from life in the deep blue sea.